So today we're going to be talking about reimagining our urban waterways. And the purpose of tonight's event is to get a broader understanding of the purpose, the benefits and the challenges of our local waterways. Urban waterways play an important role in improving water quality uh, by reducing pollution and mitigating against climate change. Um, yet we don't actually often know much about how they, how they work and there's often new science and new thinking in terms of um, the role that they can play in protecting and restoring the waterways that Canberrans have actually come to really value. Um, often we do find our waterways seem to be in poor condition, particularly some of the lakes. Um, and there are often um, threats around nutrient loads that go into our waterways, um, run off from building sites and the ever-present summer blue-green algae situation. So hopefully we're going to unpack some of those things, some of those questions for you. Um, we've got three speakers tonight, with us tonight. We're very fortunate to have um, three great speakers. Uh, Fiona Dyer will speak first to discuss urban water challenges in the ACT on a broader scale. Um, touching on what does our urban stormwater system currently look like, the challenges we face and how we could mitigate against these. Kate Harridan will then discuss the Indigenous science perspectives on urban waterways and how we might be able to reimagine these waterways uh, and reinvent how the ACT uses and enjoys urban waterways. And then we've been also been joined by Plaxi McCulloch from the ACT government who will wrap up our presentation tonight talking about the ACT government's H2OK program, which came about through funding um, or co-funding from the ACT government that went hand in hand with the federal funding um, around the Healthy Waterways projects, which was the, the, the $86 million that put in place a large chunks of infrastructure across the ACT in, in some key places. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go to introduce Fiona, but before I do, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the presence of some of the ACT Conservation Council's board members. Um, and in particular, Ian, um, Professor Ian Falconer, who's on the call tonight. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning Ian is because he has a long history and experience um, and expertise in this in this field. And um, I think it's amazing, Ian, that you're here to learn more. <laughs> so, but also maybe if you have a, a, an opportunity to contribute later in the presentation, that would be great. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, um, some of our other board members. I can see Glennis is here and Sarah Reid. Glennis Piltorni and Sarah Reid. Um, have also joined us. Apologies if I haven't seen anyone else. It's, there's a big list and we're, it's quite hard. It's hard in a technical sense to get through the entire list. Oh, Gordon McAllister. Welcome, Gordon. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Fiona Dyer. <clears throat> Fiona is Associate Professor in Water Science with the Centre for Applied Water Science and the Institute for Applied Ecology at the University of Canberra. She is a freshwater research scientist with an active research program in environmental flows, eco-hydrology and urban water quality. Fiona's interest in Canberra's urban waterways commenced more than 20 years ago, investigating water quality in Sullivan's Creek. She currently leads a major research project into the causes of algal blooms in Lake Tuggeranong, something that I know is close to many people's hearts. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Fiona. Um, and just to mention, that when we have finished all of our speakers, there should be plenty of time for people to ask questions. Um, so please feel free to jot your questions in the chat bar as you go through, and we will throw to you at the end to ask those questions if they haven't already been answered. So um, Fiona, over to you. Thanks very much, Helen. And I'll just share my screen here so that people can, can see that. Is that coming through clearly for people? Excellent. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose land I stand this evening to, to talk to you all. Um, but I've, the presentation that I've put together this evening is really to provide a, a conversation starter. It's great to see a conversation beginning among the Canberra community about how we think about our urban waterways. And so what I provide here is very much a broad context for people in some of the basics of what we're trying to achieve with urban waterways. So fundamentally, when we take a landscape that looks like this and we convert it into something that looks like this, we change the way in which it operates. 
we change the way particularly water moves across that mm -hmm. landscape. We create all these impervious surfaces, so that surfaces that can't absorb water, which changes the way that water will move across the landscape. And those couple of images that I provided there are from the development that's occurring up in the Ford area of Canberra. And when we change the way in which that landscape behaves in relation to water, we end up with faster flow of water and more water flowing from that landscape than you would normally expect. So normally that land surface, the water would filter into it and it would be a slow flow pathway into the nearby stream. But we change the way in which that hydrology works to create greater amount of, of runoff and it flows faster than it would otherwise do in a natural system. We also change what we have in that water and this here is a photo I've taken in one around one of Canberra's urban waterways. We have large pollutants, you can see there the plethora of plastic bottles, you can see the odd coffee cup, you can see that the water is not a particularly attractive colour and it contains a reasonable amount of sediment. You can also see a whole suite of um, fine organic material around the edge, that's the, the brown material there. And that's fine bark chips that have been washed off a, a nearby playground. And so we change what's actually in the water. We fundamentally change the quality of water in that system. And so when we manage urban water, there are two main principles that come into play. The first is the protection of life and property. And that's the protection of life and property from fast flowing excess amounts of water. And it's also the protection of life and property from some of the challenges associated with water quality. And the other aim is to protect downstream ecosystems. So that's to protect areas downstream of those urban areas from the problems associated with urban water quality. And historically, the way we've tended to do this is to build a suite of urban drains. These enable us to get water to move from our urban areas out of the system fast. They reduce the, the amount of flooding, they stop that water backing up and endangering life and property. And these systems can be quite large. So we have very large pipe systems through some of our urban areas. And to be perfectly honest, they're not the most attractive of systems, but they're very functional from an engineering perspective. And these enable us to get rid of large amounts of water very quickly. To manage our urban water quality, we tend to focus mm -hmm. these days mm -hmm. on having things like urban wetlands. And these slow the flow of water and help to deposit nutrients and sediments into them. And these are throughout many of our, our Canberra suburbs. The very first one uh, was constructed, I think it was about 1999 in the, the Sullivan's Creek catchment. And these occur throughout the Canberra areas. And then our ultimate line of defence is our um, urban lakes. And this is a rather attractive image of Lake Tuggeranong when it's not in bloom, uh, good bloom. Now work by my team at the University of Canberra on many of these urban waterways, um, we've been looking at the concentrations of nutrients within these systems. And we've shown that these urban water management systems like our urban ponds and our urban lakes are actually quite effective at what they're designed to do and that's remove nutrients under low flow conditions. But we also know that these systems tend to, to fill up with leaves and with rubbish um, and with wheelie bins and with traffic cones and with bicycles um, within these urban areas. And 
they take a considerable amount of effort to, to maintain them and keep them functioning well. We also know that our urban lakes are now susceptible to algal blooms. And this is an image here from a couple of summers ago on Lake Togrenong, where it experienced one of the most spectacular algal blooms I've seen. Over the past 10 to 15 years, water sensitive urban design changes have resulted in us doing things quite differently in our modern Canberra suburbs. Urban wetlands are now a common feature of those modern suburbs that are being constructed now. We have rain gardens and we have a range of other features that look to slow the water and improve the quality of water before it gets into our wetlands, before it gets into our lakes and before it gets into our downstream ecosystems. And you can see some of the creek line imagery that we have from up within the um, Gungahlin system, where instead of the concrete drain being the norm, you have a grassed um, drain system in those suburban areas. The challenges we face for the future in terms of our urban water are really around our changing climate and our growing population. I've recently had one of my students um, do a small research project to compare some of the work that I did on Sullivan's Creek back in the, the late 1990s, looking at nutrient concentrations and comparing those with concentrations of nutrients we record in Sullivan's Creek today. They've increased in concentration over that 20 year period, even though we've implemented a whole suite of water sensitive urban design features throughout the suburbs and throughout the developing areas in the headwaters of Sullivan's Creek. We also face a growing population and that introduces challenges for the way in which we manage our urban blocks and we manage our water quality in particular. And we still have to protect life and property and we still have to protect those downstream ecosystems. So what can we do to reimagine our urban waterways in Canberra? And I think fundamentally there are five things that we need to, to think about. The first is to think holistically about our urban runoff. We need to think about it from the block to the lake. We need to imagine what a smart water future for Canberra looks like, considering not just our urban waterways, but the process that delivers water into those urban waterways. As individuals, I believe we need to take ownership and responsibility for the urban waterways and for the urban water system. Water quantity and water quality is a shared responsibility. And we can't just push that back onto government agencies or someone else to look after. It needs to be owned by us all. We need to be very well aware of the implications of urban development. Impervious areas are key to the challenges that we face within urban areas and understanding what our urban development and the changes in the way in which we live and what that means for our urban waterways is important. We need to slow the flow. Slowing the flow of water across our urban landscape reduces those water levels. It allows pollutants and nutrients to deposit out of the water. And we need to be mindful of those primary constraints around protecting life property and downstream ecosystems. So that's my kickstart on the, the conversation. Um, I think we also need to be mindful of the fact that some of our urban waterways are highly valued, very attractive places in our local landscape and we need to value and protect those as well. Thank you. Great, thank you, Fiona. Um, sorry, I've just got some logistics. I'll come back to you. It's always challenging running.
Helen, you're just on mute. Sorry about that. Thanks so much, Fiona. That was great. And it's a, just such a great overview to get a, a sense of um, what, what's going on now with regards to the waterways and how it's all structured and how it's set up. Um, so if people can just um, pop questions, do feel free to pop questions in the chat bar, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and I am going to move quickly to introduce our next speaker. Um, and I've just had that really interesting happen thing happen that happened last time I did this where I get logged out of everything. I think I need to go back to some old fashioned printed out pen and paper kind of stuff. Okay. Please bear with me. Okay. My apologies. Great. Okay. So, sorry about that. Um, so, I'd like to move to introduce our next speaker, who is Kate Harridan. Kate Harridan is the current holder of the Icon Water Aspie Barrier Scholarship. She has held positions on a number of committees, including the Australian Water Association ACT Branch Committee. She's particularly interested in including Indigenous knowledge in contemporary urban water management practices and policy development. And some of you may have recently read um, an article where Kate was featured in a couple of weeks ago that we actually posted on our Facebook page. And obviously people found it very interesting and really inspiring. As I said, it was one of our most popular posts that we'd had all year actually. Um, Kate has worked as both an independent researcher and held a number of positions across government. Her PhD project was inspired by her most recent public sector position in the ACT government's Healthy Waterways project, uh, which is also the project that I mentioned that, that Plaxi has been working with as well. Um, so I'd like you to make Kate feel very welcome and we'll just um, also ensure that she can get her project up on the screen to share with you. Okay, first hurdle passed, I unmuted. <laughs> well done, Kate. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sharing a screen. You beat me on that one this time, so <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Over to you and um, hopefully that will work. Okay, that's all good, isn't it? Fantastic, yep, that's working well. <laughs> You do Marang, you and Dee, Baladu, Dumaldili, Dane, Main Wiradjuri, Walang. So, good evening. You do Marang is both Wiradjuri and Nunawal. For hello, how you going? For hello. Um, my name's Kate, and I am a proud Wiradjuri person. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, on which I'm standing on walking here in Nunawal country. That's my dog causing a problem. And um, that they never ceded sovereignty over land or waters and would particularly like to acknowledge their excellent water management skills um, and the critical role that waterways played in bringing mobs together. Um, so you think about you and mob coming up from the coast and Wiradjuri mob coming across from the west when we met on the Oval, well it's now an Oval, at ANU. We had good conversations, shared knowledge, shared produce, shared tools, develop strength and relationships, and I hope that we can have such a, a productive conversation here tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge any other First Nations people present, Yudha Marang, and really like to acknowledge just how well taken um, that beautifully written article was by Tabitha at the College of Science about my research. Honestly, never thought my work sounded so good. She did a fabulous job, and I really appreciate that people are interested in, in that. Um, so I've been looking at Indigenous water science in particular for quite some time now since doing my Masters of Arts Asian Studies degree. Um, so I have a, quite a solid understanding of particularly um, Indigenous water knowledge overseas, but also a reasonable grounding in water knowledge and practices for uh, Australian Indigenous peoples. And my Thai language skills are way better than my Wiradjuri skills. In that sub-thesis, I did the old compare and contrast between um, Pumbanya Tongtin, which is Thai local wisdom, uh, which is the indigenous body of science from that mainland Southeast Asia area. And I compared it with the notion of stormwater that we have in urban Australia. And in, in this thing that I will unhappily, unhappily call tonight modern science. Essentially in this paper, now the next technical challenge. <laughs> in, in that sub thesis, I argue that stormwater is, is an intellectual construct 
that allows the notion that you can have this waste of water, this stream of water, sorry, that's waste that operates essentially as a, a free sink for capitalist externalities, which we might call pollution, and also provides covert support for the idea that clean water is a commodified product um, and, and an economic good. When really all that, when you get down to it, when you get, all stormwater really is, is overland flow going through concrete infrastructure. And for some reason it becomes a, a wastewater in many indigenous sciences and in particularly Pumbanya Tongtin, the Thai local wisdom. They can't countenance the notion that you'll have this stream of water that's waste that just gets, just gets disregarded. Oh, excuse me for a second. Oi. Uh. Cheeky, um, dogs again. Um, and this is this unwillingness to, to accept the idea that water can be waste isn't just because they only get water once a year in the wet season. It's because there's this understanding, there's a sense of interconnectedness that's of everything that's around us and a sense of mutual obligation through relationships developed by that interconnectedness. So just taking a tie, Kumbanya Tongtin example, um, this, there has historically been a way to measure annual rainfall or, or the hydrological cycle over a year um, based on the number of Nag or Naga drinking water locally. So Naga is the highest of spiritual beings and entities in the environment in this way of thinking. They are powerful. They have, they're similar, not related at all, but similar to the rainbow serpent in that their movement through the land and waterscape actually establishes the land and waterscape. Um, and in this, in this uh, water measuring framework, there's seven Nagas. They come and drink the water each year at the end of the wet season. In a one Nag year, uh, it's likely that there's severe flooding because it's not possible that it can drink all the water. In a seven Nag year, it's quite probably drought because the, all the nags are drinking all the available water. People are relatively sanguine about this notion, except for maybe when all seven are drinking their little hearts out because these animals are important. These, spirit, these beings are, are important in both the physical realm and the spiritual realm, realm. And if they're happy and satisfied, then everything else around them is happy and satisfied. Um, and I, I think this measurement is really interesting because it speaks to a community that's particularly interested or concerned about drought rather than flood because if everyone's drinking your water, then you see water as a much more valuable commodity, which again feeds back into this notion of why would you have a stream of water that's considered waste? Which brings us to another question is that if we know stormwater is a construct with many known consequences, only some of which were touched on by Fiona because there's just so many of them, it's not an environmental process like overland flow. There's, and we know there's so many other ways of understanding water, valuing water, managing water, allocating water. So why do we still persist with this, con this intellectual construct and the associated infrastructure? So I'm, I'm trying to have a, I'm trying to have a shot at challenging this in my PhD, but starting from the position, I've uh, got to be a bit pragmatic that stormwater uh, concrete infrastructure in places like Canberra for sure is not going anywhere. So what we need to try to do is um, modify them, which is kind of what Fiona touched on with the talk about water sensitive urban designs being built into the concrete system. So I'm playing in um, the stormwater channel formerly known as Yarralumba Creek and in, I have attempted to apply some Indigenous research practices and some uh, Indigenous structures, which you've got images up on here. I'll just quickly go through them. So this one up on the top left hand side is actually, you can see the little filtration thing, you probably can't see me pointing at it. It's very different to teaching in a lecture theatre where you can just point at the screen. <laughs> I mean, you can see, so this is one rain, sorry, one rice paddy, water's feeding into the next rice paddy, so it's got a little filtration system. And below that is a floating wetland, which is local wisdom capitalising on the quite substantial um, floating wetlands that used to exist naturally, they were strong enough that people could stand on them to fish and stuff. And now they're being, um, that water filtration capacity is being harnessed in an urban environment 
So that's in Stormwater Channel or Klong in Thailand. Top right hand side is um, something I tried to do but couldn't really get away with. In the Yarralong Creek Channel is a fish fence in Thailand that works with high flow. And when catches fish on the upstream side, water drains away, fish lay on the ground on the upstream side, you can catch them. And Wiradjuri Mob did a similar thing, but sort of the inverse in that they built up um, holes or, or depressions in the banks on the downstream side and would catch fish in the water as the channels dried out and take what they needed as they needed. And the one at the bottom is at the end of a complex of about 10 rain, uh, rice paddies. And so it's the last little bit of filtration before it goes into the creek, which is just sort of up of the thing there. So the thing in the middle is actually one of the things I've put in the channel. It's a leaky weir, which is found in lots of bodies of water knowledge. Um, and it's doing exactly what Fiona says is one of the key things we need to do is it slows the flow. So we've slowed the flow right down here. We've got some, a sediment catching bag. And then the sediment piles up behind, you can get islands and stuff over time. So I've been working with these small things uh, in the hope that not only will we get water quality treatment, oh, so water quality outcomes, but that we'll be able to create, quite probably temporarily, sites of increased biodiversity and biological activity. So in a sense, my work is rejecting uh, water sensitive urban design and similar frameworks like sensitive urban design systems, so suburban urban design, sensitive urban design systems and low impact development systems. Because I've, I've jumped on board the nature based solution boat and I took this leap for a reason that's actually really quite relevant to my presentation tonight is that it explicitly nature based solutions explicitly has a role for indigenous practices and knowledge. Uh, which brings me to the point where I can finally, after many minutes, stop talking about myself and talk about the three things I've been asked to talk about, which is Indigenous perspectives in reimagining our waterways, which obviously I've already kind of started to do, moving into the challenging challenges of using Indigenous perspectives to manage our urban waterways and then some solutions. Uh, the first thing about Indigenous perspectives that I think we need to take on board and it's really quite simple is the notion of diachronic data sets and in, in, these are like the holy grail of many aspects of modern science because and a key reason why um, people are interested it's for some reason for, for now in um, Indigenous science is that these data sets have long-term detailed data about so, like a place might be a very small place, it might be a big place, it's not a huge place. They're really detailed, really deep and very site specific sets of data, um, which in a place, oh my goodness, I've got the thumbs up already. Um, first one of two. Um, and so this data represents a, a long and deep understanding of the waterscape in which people are working. And I've never seen anything like it reflected in the stuff I've read of modern, modern science um, water research. Indigenous science in broad brushstrokes is less overtly um, economically focused, has a social different set of social systems and values embedded, recognises and unashamedly acknowledges, acknowledges the spiritual and in some ways these represent the pattern of nature in Thailand. You've got the, the spirits of fat in the water, the Pichum Nam, and the smaller ones live in the smaller creeks, the medium sized ones live in the more medium sized tributaries and the bigger, more powerful ones live in the rivers. So it's like the biological, the, the creek ordering system that we use, but just with spirits. Um, and these priorities, different priorities and values lead to a different way that the science is practiced. And it really comes a lot down to relationships and interconnectedness. And that's relationships between and with everything, between all the people, the people and all the animals, the way the sun interacts with the trees, the way we interact with the trees. A simple way, I guess, of explaining how this affects the way we do science and engage with the landscape is all the Radjuri's people, main totem is Guga, is the Goanna. We have a special relationship with Guga. We have special obligations and particular responsibilities to Guga. So it makes us particularly reluctant to want to overexploit Guga in any way or damage Guga's environment because if you damage Guga, you damage yourself. And that's not a great thing. The other thing that's different really is notions of time. 
Indigenous sciences, particularly Australian Indigenous sciences, time is not linear. It's in, it's out, it's all around. It's not, it's, it's not non-repetitive, if you get that. And so it's a bit like, but more complicated than the doctor's wibbly wobbly notion of time. And it gives the opportunity to have extended observation periods when you're trying to work out what's happening with the system and what you want to do with the system. Um, I just got a bit confused for a second there. So then we have all these challenges, which I really list as one, which is obduracy. And you can see I've tried to pretend to make a categories out of them. Um, and because of time, I've had thumbs up. I'll leave you to read them. But really what they all come back to is we can't keep doing stuff in the same way. If we have other knowledge systems, why do we persist with one set of, standard, of standards of evidence? Who gets to decide what is legitimate knowledge, legitimate practices? And all this obduracy all wraps up so that ultimately it comes to the point where there's this resistance to Indigenous science and the values and perspectives that they can give to reimagining urban waterways. I'm a little bit optimistic, so I like to think there are solutions. Um, again, I've sort of done the big picture category thing. Uh, the first thing we need to do really is think differently. We need to seek out, test new ways of knowledge and ways of thinking. It doesn't have to just be academics or people in research organisations. Individuals can do that. Reading things like um, Gamage's biggest state on earth gives such a different perspective to be able to find solutions to old problems. Um, would you, when this is all filled up, this is my channel bank storage site that one day we can sunbake in on the top left hand. If that was all filled up and green, it was a nice sunny summer afternoon and we've got all these little ponds, chains of islands here and the water's just bubbling away. Why wouldn't you want to sunbake there? I think that'd be lovely. We also need to take on different roles and, and, and here I'm talking about community engagement and community activism. It needs to be, we need to look well beyond what we're currently doing with community engagement. Why is it that we can't, as citizens, help actually design infrastructure, build the infrastructure, maintain the infrastructure. Like when people accost me on the creek, I tell them all the time, pull the plastic out, help me keep it clean, pull the plastic out between us, we can get the creek better. Um, it doesn't have to be just the professionals, it can be us. And community activism, get involved, start your own little thing, get involved in something like Water Watch. There's someone in Sullivan's Creek now is doing something. He's trying to bring culture to the drains. Find out about what activities they have planned. There's so much to do. And what we really need to do, of course, is just consider evidence and decolonise the way we do stuff and decolonise our minds. This picture on the top is um, from the Healthy Waterways Project. That's what they turned it into. And the picture at the bottom is what it was before. I've been testing this site for 10 years. Because there was a focus on simply one parameter to humidity, they missed all the other stuff that was going on at that site that brings a range of values to that site and gives a completely different use for us as human beings at that site. So the last thing I think that we can all do in a way of solution is Injmara, which is a really simple but kind of complex thing from um, Wiradjuri. It's a word that means to be gentle, slow, honourable, um, patient, respectful, but what it really is is a way of life. It's the way you're supposed to deal with people, with country, with everything that's going on around you. And if we could um, adopt that, then we would slow down and wouldn't rush to make decisions about what changes we need to do. We wouldn't be stuck on the same path because we'd have time to stop to think, is this the best path? How does this work for the other animals? How does it work for Guga? is what I would ask, <laughs> my first question. So yes, um, if we take time, if we're respectful, then solutions will come. So, mandangu, and some references. Thank you, Kate. So, um, get my screen back on. Thank you, Kate. Sorry to wrap you up so quickly, but hopefully people can ask some questions later and we can come back to you. That would be great. Um, okay, I'm going to throw to our last speaker for, for the evening. Um, and thank you for all the good questions that are coming through. Um, and I'd like to introduce Plaxi McCulloch, who has um, come to join us from the ACT government. Plaxi is the catchment programs officer in the ACT Nature Resource Management Unit which sits within the Environment Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate 
at the ACT government. She is working on design and implementation of the next phase of the H2OK Stormwater Education and Behaviour Change Program, uh, with a focus on addressing blue-green algae out outbreaks. Um, thank you, Plaxi. I'll throw to you, and we'll see if we can get you up on the screen if you have a presentation. Thanks, Ellen. Oh. <laughs> I remembered. Um, yes, I'll share my screen. Thanks very much for having me and hello everybody. Those were two fantastic and very interesting presentations. Um, uh, so I am not a water scientist, not an expert. I still, I'm quite new working in uh, government. I still see myself as a, a passionate citizen who's joined the public service to try to um, maximize my usefulness in helping our society to um, become, I won't say sustainable, I'll say regenerative, because we have, we don't want to sustain what we've got, we need to make it a lot better first. Um, so, so yeah, so I'm now in the um, ACT Natural Resources, Resource Management Unit, which is in the um, environment planning and sustainable development directorate you can see i really am quite new um, and i came on board just as the healthy waterways program was wrapping up um, and the the h2ok program the part that was funded by the healthy waterways program was was coming to completion as well but um, but we don't need to stop doing that work and we can't stop doing that work if we want to see change it's a long-term project um, so what with the the healthy waterways project um, the money's been spent and 20 new constructed wetlands and rain gardens and ponds and riparian restorations which is just um, putting vegetation back along some of the concrete channels um, that infrastructure works all happened the the plants are still in an establishment phase for the next couple of years, so they haven't fully come to um, full functioning yet. But we can see that the uh, the projects are working to to reduce nutrients and sediments uh, getting into our lakes. Um, but what we can also see what what Fiona's research is teaching us is that they're never going to be the solution. They're, they only take out um, the water that travels through the money, it travels through when there are low flows. And what Fiona's learned, uh, showed us is that, um, I think around 50%, she'll be able to tell me if that's right, of the phosphorus, which is the main nutrient we're concerned about with blue-green algae, is in a dissolved form, which only a little bit of that is going to be taken out by the plants and, and soils and so on on the way through. Most of it's getting straight into our lakes. Um, the Healthy Waterways Project also established the H2OK program, which is a community education and behavior change program, um, which is what I'll talk about for the rest of this presentation. Um, and we've also established partnerships with the three catchment groups um, that some of you will be very familiar with, um, perhaps everybody, but perhaps not. They're the um, Southern ACT catchment group, Malonglo conservation group, and the Ginandera catchment group. So um, I'm, I won't stop and talk about them just at this point, but I will come back to it if I can, to the great work that they're doing too. So what, um, what we've learned from the research so far is that a huge amount of nutrients enter our lakes through stormwater. Well, um, Fiona in particular has been looking at Lake Tuggeranong, but we can assume this is true for the other lakes as well, that um, although there's a lot of nutrients already in the lakes, in sediments, about four to five times that amount enters every year through stormwater. 
I mentioned that a lot of the phosphorus is dissolved, so we can't filter that out. Um, so infrastructure is part of the solution, but we can never we can never put in enough wetlands to to solve the problem. So it's about um, stopping the pollutants, the pollution at the source, not getting them into the water in the first place. Um, and what we're learning is that the nutrients are coming from diffuse sources across our catchments and across those areas of our catchments uh, that are suburbs. Um, they're not coming, I mean, amongst other land uses, um, as opposed to point sources where we can just figure out where it's coming from and do something about it. So that means that health, householder behaviours are implicated and are really important. Important, along with behaviours of businesses and industry, and even uh, even and government behaviours as well. So we're looking at how we can improve across the board. But my work is focused on helping um, behaviour change at the householder level. We know, and I know this very well personally, um, because of my own ignorance coming into this this role. Um, we know. Sorry, I'm just turning off my timer. Um, that there are big gaps in what the ACT community knows about stormwater. Even it's such a technical sounding word to my ears, what it is, it's rainwater that is not no longer absorbed because of all the impervious surfaces that we've created. Um, where it goes, it doesn't go to a treatment plant. Not everyone understands that either. Um, so yeah, people don't realize necessarily that there are two entirely separate systems of pipes underground. There's the sewer system that goes to a treatment plant and there's the stormwater pipes that go directly to our waterways. Um, people would not necessarily know that um, organic materials like leaves are uh, pollution. Soil is pollution. It's kind of like weeds when they're in the wrong place. When they're in the right place, they're really great. When they're in the wrong place, they're pollution. Um, and so um, I read this concept somewhere that in a city, we all live next to a waterway. You can think of yourself as living right next to a lake. So at a lake, there's going to always be leaves and um, you know, bird poop and so on entering the lakes and that's fine if it's just from around the lake. That's how the system has evolved. But in a city with our concrete stormwater channels and our pipes, every, every leaf that falls on a road will get swept down the stormwater drain and in a flash will be in our lakes. So everything coming off our nature strips is going to end up in the lakes. Um, and the other, the other knowledge gap that we need to fill is, so what can people do about it? Maddie, you'll give me a thumbs up when I'm running out of time, won't you? Um, so the H2OK program went for three years and included a range of activities that attempted to um, fill those knowledge gaps and, and uh, show people what can be done. Um, I won't run through them all, but this one nice example was the drain stenciling um, that we'll try and keep up just to let people know that the drains connect directly to our waterways. Um, so because we know now that uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, particularly phosphorus, are uh, coming from our whole catchments and are the cause of the blue-green algae outbreaks, um, we can, we know what most likely are the most significant sources um, of that phosphorus, of those nutrients, and they include leaves, both autumn leaves and the all-year-round leaves. Um, grass clippings when we mow our lawns, that might seem very minor, but fresh leaves contain a lot more phosphorus than the autumn leaves do. Um, trouble with autumn leaves is there's such a huge amount of them. 
fertilizer could be coming from our um, gardens. Dog poo, you'd be, I'm, I was a bit amazed to discover this is, this is a significant source, but apparently it is. Um, and again, it's because it's, uh, because of our impervious surfaces. If it's a kangaroo pooping out in the a reserve, that's not gonna end up in the lakes. But dog poo on a footpath or road is. Um, soil, because soil, um, phosphorus attaches to um, clay sediments in particular. So um, that's another way that nutrients are entering our system. And I've put soil twice there because um, some of the behaviours that we hope to see more of are around people um, nurturing the soils that they have, not just preventing erosion, but um, bringing back the soil sponge that, that retains the water and retains the nutrients where, we, where it's of value and slows the water down. Um, so we've, we're partnering now with the catchment groups mainly to continue the, um, the education around those um, questions of what storm is, where does it, what storm water is and where it goes and that it isn't treated. Uh, and they're also encouraging stewardship of these beautiful new assets that we have um, to try to engage communities around them and also uh, basically help the government to be able to afford to maintain them because that's quite an, a um, large new expense that we've created by putting in all these um, wetlands and so on. <clears throat> so the more people that can that uh, join those stewardship groups, um, the more sustainable they become as, a, as part of our solution. Um, my program is now becoming more and more focused on how do we nurture behaviour change because we know that just education on its own um, isn't necessarily all that's needed. So we're looking at very specific behaviours and researching around the barriers to those behaviours, the benefits that people um, find from them and how we can reduce the barriers and increase the benefits. We're going to test whether our uh, campaigns actually work before we roll them out and spend a lot of money. And, um, and the focus that we've got at the moment is around autumn leaves. And in particular, getting them off the road, out of the road gutters safely um, and regularly. Uh, so that's the top thing that I would recommend if anyone's wondering what they can do. Um, at the moment, it's, there's still plenty of autumn leaves in the gutters. I heard that um, a couple of decades ago, the culture in Canberra was to burn leaves, which of course was horrendous for our air quality. And it was before uh, ACT government. So it was when we had oodles of Commonwealth funds available and the street sweepers went around about 10 times more frequently. And so people were actually encouraged to sweep their autumn leaves onto the road. Um, but now we cannot afford that frequent street sweeping and it's become a huge problem. So we need to change that culture. Um, so they're fantastic for nurturing soil health. The best thing to do is to mow over them if you can to shred them up and leave them on, the, on your grass or use them for mulch, compost them, or you can put them in the green bins. Um, we want people to avoid using fertilizer where possible. And if you do have to use or choose to use fertilizer, then check the rain forecast before you put it out and make sure it's not gonna rain for a couple of days. Um, you water it in by hand, but don't let the rain water it in because it's more likely to end up down the drain. Pick up dog poo, of course. Um, do some learning about how to bring back the soil sponge in the bit of um, Ngunnawal country that you're caring for. And make your activities as visible as you can. So I'm thinking of that we might encourage people to set up um, 
leaf composters in front yards rather than backyards. Um, spread the word, get people involved, get your groups involved um, to, to increase your influence. Um, share your commitment to, to um, the behaviours that you're going to change um, as publicly as you can and you can put them in the chat now if you wish to. Um, one of the recommended ways to make a change is to think consciously about when you're going to do the behaviour, where you're going to do it and make it as specific, as specific as you possibly can. So I invite you to think now about whether there's something that you could do um, to keep nutrients on your property and not let them escape onto the road or down the drain. Um, and share that with us if you would like to. And I would love to hear your ideas. It's very difficult for me to do much face-to-face um, uh, -face consultation or research at the moment because of COVID. So um, if you have any ideas um, that we could use, please share them with me. And that's my email address. And I also would encourage you to get in touch with your local catchment group if you're interested in um, caring for your local waterways. Thank you very much. Thank you, Plexi. Sounds like you've got your work cut out for you there. Indeed. Um, okay, so we're gonna to go to questions now. We've got lots of questions coming through on the chat bar. Um, it's, we've got 35 minutes for questions. We're due to wrap up at seven o'clock and the presenters will hopefully be available for that time. What I'm gonna do, uh, because we can, and we have a bit of time tonight is, um, I'm actually going to throw to people who've asked questions. Oh, actually, no, we've got lots. Maybe I'm just going to read them out and pitch them to people. So, um, I've gone back up to the top and I'm going to throw the first question to you, Fiona, um, which is from Kate. Um, is there an obvious reason why the nutrients have risen in Sullivan's Creek, even though all the inner North wetlands have been put in in recent years? Start you with a curly one. Um, this probably the short answer is no, um, but the longer answer is that we have some some suggestions as to why that that might be the case. The population in that catchment has increased considerably in that time, and if you look at the urban development across the the catchment and the change in the last twenty years the impervious areas within the suburbs have changed. So we are now building much larger houses on the blocks. So there's been a changeover over that period of time. And so that could be contributing to a greater amount of runoff from the area. So there's more water going into that, that system um, and there's less opportunity for, for infiltration. It could also be tangled up with the changes that we've seen in our climate over the past 20 years. Um, so we are getting more summer storms. We are getting uh, more intense summer storms when our land surfaces are actually quite, um, quite denuded. So over the summer period where it's been incredibly dry, you've um, you know, we've had bare surfaces. You get a summer storm on that, you get a lot of material washing off. So there's a whole range of potential reasons, uh, but we haven't nailed it down. And there's quite often very rarely a single culprit for these things. It's usually multiple things. Great, thank you, Fiona. Um, I've got a question that I know is further down the list, but it is for Kate. Um, and the question is, Kate, how does the ACT government respond to your small scale interventions in the concrete um, channels? And what happens to those um, in a flood event? Do they, do they cause difficulty? Do they become a liability? Do they obstruct flows in pipes and things like that? How does that sort of, um, how can that be integrated and how does it work? Um, I would say the answer to the first part of the question is quietly. Everyone who needs to know does. Um, the actual pieces of infrastructure are quite small, the smallest, uh, leaky weir is, I think, 75 centimetres long, it might be 70. 
And the largest um, piece in the, that comes with the channel bank storage site, I think it's 1.8 metres. Um, and they're all now extraordinarily stable and I haven't lost one. We just had a nice big flush, haven't lost anything. So I've spent some time trying to make them more stable. Um, and usually uh, they've broken rather than gone downstream. And when they've gone downstream, I've been able to either find the bits of them or pull them out of the GPT. All of the infrastructure I put in is lower in the catchment. So it's not going through any concrete channels, any pipes rather, it's all just open channel. And I've deliberately designed them so they are low profile, like sit quite close to the actual concrete surface so that uh, it greatly minimises um, flooding and stuff. I mean, those channels are, let's be fair, ridiculously over-engineered as it is. Um, so they're quite small, quite unobtrusive in terms of the hydrological, hydro, hydro, hydraulic, <laughs> the hydraulics of it all. <laughs> yeah. um, does that answer that question? I can go on, I can go on. So I guess I have a follow-up question, which is how do you see them potentially being utilised on a wider scale? I have many grand plans or visions, but I think the one of the good things about them is they can probably work quite nicely with the larger infrastructure that's already been constructed. So if you think um, on this same channel on Yalam Creek, they've put in three, three and a half, they might pretend they're four projects, but um, so there's a wetland, a uh, sorry, a, like a garden of rain gardens and a, to a riffle and an armouring site. And um, particularly between the wetland, which is upstream near Mawson, and the rain gardens, which are down near Curtin at the um, flood memorial site, you could have a series of these small infrastructures in and that could help boost the water quality benefit that's gained from those other infrastructure. Because I test the water coming out of the Mawson channel, at uh, the Mawson wetland, sorry. And I know the water coming out is good. They, th they wanted to reduce nitrate, phosphate and turbidity, done a great job. Catch is, it's treating a relatively small portion of water and you can see by the time you get down to Parramatta Road at Phillip, if anyone knows where that footbridge is at the bus stop there, by the time you get down there, the water is testing, the results are coming out the same for nitrate, phosphates and turbidity as it was upstream at the confluence of the stormwater channel and Yale on the creek. So the influence of those larger infrastructures doesn't last very long in the channel and only treats, only treats a small portion of the water anyway. So you could have something, you could like support that, it could like work together. Mm. Other stuff, but that's the one I think that fits most nicely in what we've talked about tonight. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. Um, I'm going to go to you, Plexi. They've got a couple of questions I'm going to throw your way. Um, I think you've probably answered the first one, which is about... <clears throat> um, uh, from Chris Emery, which says that much of the rubbish and leaves going to our lakes comes from our streets. Uh, most cities sweep their streets once a week. Canberra only sweeps several times a year. Why is this? Um, you alluded to a funding challenge there. And I also, I imagine that with the particular seasonal changes with the autumn leaves, there's a particular time of year where it's a high priority um, to, to sweep the streets. Um, but I wonder if I can also throw you another question, which was about about the idea, and this might be for other speakers as well, potentially you, Fiona, about the areas that exist before the concrete pipes, um, generally mown areas that would have been creeks and chains of ponds, um, and whether there's a possibility to re-establish something like that, slowing the water and reducing the pollutants as the water goes into the wider, the wider stormwater system. Um, I guess it's not set up for that at the moment, but that, that was just an idea that's been put. Um, I'm not sure if you're if you if you're able to answer questions about the infrastructure, but that might be something for you, Fiona, as well. Plaxi, do you want to just um, touch on that first street cleaning one? Um, yeah, you nailed it. I believe it is all about funding, um, trade-offs. If we spend more on that, then we spend less on something else. Um, I'm still learning about the whether it's as simple as that. I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm not very knowledgeable knowledgeable about that yet still figuring that out, but I know it's going to come down to funding. Um, uh, on the um, second question, um, I hope that Fiona will be able to answer that better than I can. Um, it sounds to me... priorities. Sorry, Chris? Yes, I think that's Fun what... Funding, funding just comes down to priorities. I mean, yes. cities... Yes. All I've lived in Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, New York, London. They all sweep once a week. The priority is not to get the stuff off our streets in Canberra. 
and it's much more important to do other things um, like have a tram. Um, so Chris, Chris I, I think that's exactly what Plexi just said. <laughs> Funding is about decisions and priorities and I, I suspect that she's not going to be able to answer that question any further than that really from where she's sitting. Um, so I'm just going to throw to Fiona. Um, Fiona, the idea of changing or restructuring the flows into the waterways, is that, is that a live possibility? I mean, we've got these massive concrete drains, but what about how the water goes into the drains? Because at the moment it does seem to sort of quickly get sucked from the roads into a stormwater system underground and fast-tracked into the stormwater system. Is there other things that we can do and potentially in established suburbs where we can slow that flow of water into those stormwater systems? There's a whole range of things that can be done to try to slow the flow from the individual area into that stormwater system. Um, but it's not simple and it's not easy. Um, if it was, then um, we probably would have done it by now. Um, so in lots of urban, in urban areas, so if you've got an individual house, then trying to retain water on stormwater, the, the water that runs off your roof on your own block is the, the priority. And in large storm events, that's actually really quite difficult. One of the reasons that we try to move water off surfaces in urban areas and away from properties is to reduce flooding. So you don't want a backup of water into people's houses, um, and across roads and things like that. So that's actually a, a complicated process. And in many of our older suburbs, we don't have the space to be able to put in the rain gardens, to be able to put in the, the wetlands, to be able to, to treat the water. But if we're redoing a driveway or we're redoing a footpath, we can think about using permeable pavement. So that's pavement that enables water to infiltrate through those areas instead of running immediately off. So these are things that are being done in some of the, the newer areas around um, Canberra, um, but they're typically not retrofitted into the, the older suburbs where we have that established um, stormwater network. And there are possibilities there again, it does come down to that process of, of funding and um, how we can do it. But that's where I say that individuals need to think about taking ownership on their own blocks. If you're going to redo a path, redo it with something that's permeable. If you're going to redo a driveway, investigate um, the, the pervious surfaces that can be used in your own driveway so that we can each take a bit of responsibility for it. I'd also like to pipe up here. I think that this is a, actually a really great question in terms of what I was saying about decolonising our minds. We're trained, particularly in Canberra, it amazes me, to um, short, green, trimmed grass on the sides of the roads. That's, that's just a cultural preference. There's no, there's no other reason for it. We, if we considered training our cultural preferences so that we were happy to accept that scrappy looking brown seedy grass that na native grasses tend to be, then you would get your slow flow to the top of the concrete catchment. These are simple things that can be done really simply and quite easily. It's simply changing the organic matter there. Like, are we going to have grass there or are we going to put something in that's much more effective for slowing flow? It all comes back to this socio-cultural obduracy. We just don't want to consider really significant changes in the way we think about the, both the land and the waterscape in which, we, in which we walk. Flooding is another classic example. Why can't we just remember that flooding is actually really important in the overall cycle of soil replenishment and plants growing and food being created and try to live with a little bit of flooding? One of the great things about being able to work in the Yarralong catchment is a lot of that particularly downstream portion of that channel has those great big open green spaces. Why don't we just design more of them? If we're going to have concrete channels, you can do this kind of stuff. It's not that simple. It comes back to the really neat way Claxi talked about conflicting priorities in government. It's not about funding. It's the funding is a reflection of the, the socio-cultural priorities. 
And if governments don't want to treat waterways better, if they don't want to reimagine waterways better, they're not going to fund it. They're not even going to send those trucks that we already own out once a fortnight or once a month to sweep our streets. They'd rather spend the money on, I don't care what it is, but they've decided they don't want to spend the money on water quality and, and urban water management. Thanks, Kate. I'm feeling super virtuous now that I've transformed my lawn into a native garden with a swale right across the middle of it over the COVID period. So, <laughs> but actually it was that, that whole new concept of thinking about how do you keep water on your block longer and how do you slow the runoff? And it was something I'd never really thought about before, but it was certainly fun to build it. Um, we've had lots of rain events since then too. So I've been able to test it quite effectively. It's, it's been great. Excellent. Um, Fiona, I'm going to throw another question to you. Uh, I think it's quite a technical one about uh, the use of algal farming as a way to clean up waterways and sometimes make food or other products. Have these programs got legs in an urban setting? Uh, so this is really about farming algae and so switching from some of the toxic algae that you get within lakes to a saleable commodity. I think the challenge with with algae and particularly blue-green algae is that if there was a nice easy solution out there it would be implemented worldwide. There's not. It's a problem. Blue-green algal blooms are problems across the world. Um, every system is different. Um, so Lake Toganong uh, has been a surprise even though we recognise that every system is different. Um, it's been quite a surprise in the, the way that it, it works. Um, so the solutions to, to blue-green algal blooms uh, are not straightforward and simple. There are some areas where people have attempted to grow um, algae in systems and harvest it and use it, um, but it's, it's not straightforward to be able to do that and there's no, you know, there's no real guarantees that, that it's going to work. Um, I'm not a, I don't know detail about it, um, but it's not widely implemented. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to throw this one to the panel and if, if anyone would like to answer it, feel free. Um, what On the viability of the wide-scale wide scale use of composting toilets doesn't mean, may, mean to make sense um, to defecate into high quality water when nutrients or, and organic matter are needed on land. I, I, hazarding a guess that ACT Health would have um, conniptions at this idea being widely implemented across an urban urban landscape. But um, has anyone got any comments on that or any reflections on that? Uh, so I guess the, the comment that I would make is that it those sorts of things are part of a broader conversation about the whole of water cycle that's going to have to happen within our society as we have more people and the same or less water available to them. So we're going to have to have conversations like that about what we expect and how we, we manage it. Um, and you know, maybe in part of imagining the future, that's something that gets investigated. Composting toilets are very effective in um, some regional parts of, of Australia. Uh, it's just what, you know, we, we don't expect it in an urban area. One of the silliest things ever done, really, isn't it? Um, potable supply to shit in. Like, at least my dog can go playing in the stormwater channels. They can't go playing in the sewage treatment plant. Um, but in, uh, there's this thing that's happening called community-led total sanitation. It's quite, it's a way of thinking about the way you do sanitation um, in the development sector. And they actually already have, I don't know much about it, but I do know that they have trialled things like decentralised community uh, decent, yeah, decentralised community composting toilet systems. So small communities, not large urban environments like we live in, but small communities, um, because they can't. They just, you just it's, un, it's entirely unfeasible that every human being should be connected to a toilet that has potable supply. It's ridiculous. We shouldn't even be. So yeah, they, they, that kind of stuff's happening. Community-led total sanitation in the development sector. And I'm sorry, I can't add. I'm not aware of the ACT government's stance on that question. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. That's really interesting. Um, okay, so I'm just going back up to... 
sorry, I was going down and back up. Hang on a second. Uh, I saw you had a, a question there. Can I jump in and yeah, jump answer in. one about the soil sponge? I use that term without explaining what I meant. So sorry about that. Um, I was thinking about um, healthy soils ability to absorb an enormous amount of water um, and filter it and clean it. Um, and it does that by through the, um, the vast quantities of life that um, exist in healthy soil and that and it requires um, a degree of aeration so which plant roots and the uh, worms and animals will create um, and which is destroyed through compaction. So things like um, parking our cars on nature strips, for example, will lead to erosion of the soil after a while because it's lost the ability to um, keep, keep life in it. And once the life has died off, it, wind and water will just wash it away. So you no longer have the soil sponge um, aspect. It's dirt, not soil. So it's about bringing back, re, re, avoiding compaction and encouraging life back into our soils on, on any little patches that we care for. Perhaps we could raise some revenue for your program to extend Plaxi by um, issuing some tickets for Canberrans parking on their nature strips. <laughs> like things to be cost neutral. I'll pass um, on that idea. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. <laughs> uh, okay, I've got a question from Sarah. I've heard that the liquid that is drained from the Bakashi bean compost, composted with Bakashi sawdust, is beneficial at reducing blue-green algae. Is there any truth to this? I think this is for you, Fiona, and I'm guessing that that we're coming back to the, there may not be an easy solution, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, so look, um, there are examples where people have used sawdust, um, where they've used all sorts of interesting things and they've had a positive effect on blue-green algae within systems. It doesn't play out into large lake systems. It's typically small systems where those things have been tried. Most of the things that you will see as potential solutions to algal bloom problems have not been tested systematically. So they're based, the evidence that they present essentially we had blue-green algae, we did something, we don't have blue-green algae afterwards. There's often not a, a proper causal mechanism there, they've not been scientifically evaluated. Um, but unfortunately people then rush out because they have the, the latest solution and there's a huge market out there of people desperately wanting to do something. Um, so yep, might have worked once, um, but it may never work again. Um, and you know, so, some of the, the places where you actually see some of these studies, it's simply a seasonal shift in the algal community. It's like, well, you had algae over summer, you don't have it in winter, you applied a treatment, must have worked. Um, so it's actually difficult. It's really difficult. Um, thank you. I'm just going to acknowledge that there's some questions in the chat bar around um, leaves and leaf collection and use of leaves for compost. Um, thank you everybody for sharing intel about ways of managing leaves and sharing leaves as compost. Um, I think the point is that, that leaves are an important, are, are an important have important nutrient values and can be used on gardens and can be used particularly if you run the uh, run the hand mower over them you can break them down and put them on your garden beds and use them as mulch um, and to, to just try and stop them go down the storm drain they can also go into the green beans which have been rolled out across the ACT so that's something else that people can do if they can't find any other way to get rid of them um, it was really interesting because I did notice cleaning up the autumn leaves this year how much of that silt and soil and um, kind of because it's been quite a wet season had sort of broken down already on the side of the road so when I started digging my leaves up there was actually an entire layer like sort of two inch layer of amazing wonderful kind of nutrient material um, so I dug that up and chucked that back on the garden as well it holds the leaves down really well so if you do it in that order highly recommend it um, so another question that has come up here um, is around water tanks and have water tanks made any difference? And I guess that's about catching water on uh, a residential block and potentially reducing the amount of water that's eventually going down into the stormwater system. And obviously it catches a little bit 
may not slow it down much once it, the water tank's full. Um, has anyone got any comments around the use of water tanks? So it's sort of the push for putting residential water tanks in has, has sort of lessened in recent years, it seems. So I can probably contribute to that. The research shows it's very much the effectiveness of rainwater tanks is about how you use them. So if they're always full, then they're not much use at all. They should always be as close to empty as possible, ready to catch the, the rain that, that falls. So um, the best you know, way of um, optimising your rainwater tank to reduce runoff into the, the suburb is to have it almost empty when it starts to rain. Yep. <laughs> and quite often that's not the way people use them. People tend to, that's, they save their water in there um, for, for when it's really, really dry. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so they, they often find that where they've been implemented large scale across cities, they're not super effective because people are not working them and not working them hard. Yep. Um, I'm going to go to a very much bigger picture question around the Murray-Darling Basin. And the question is, is the basin better off environmentally if we release as much water as we can downstream? Or is it okay to trap or dam our stormwater here and recycle it within the ACT? Um, so this is a question that sort of uh, acknowledges that we're a key part of the Murray, well, not a key part, but we're a small part of the Murray-Darling Basin, but we are part of the Murray-Darling um, system in terms of the amounts of water that come in and out of the ACT. Um, and the water that we do release from the ACT goes um, down the Murrumbidgee and, and in, back into the basin system. Um, so I guess, I, I, I'm not sure, but I think the answer might be around the quantities that we're talking about. Is that right? So I think the thing to be well aware of is that in a natural, more natural landscape, a large part of the water that falls onto that landscape infiltrates through that soil profile. It's used to grow plants um, and it doesn't actually reach the river itself. When we put a concrete surface across there, that water runs straight off. It doesn't go into that soil profile. So by urbanising an area, we increase the amount of, of water that runs off. So there's an interesting balancing game within the Canberra area as to the amount of water that would have flowed from that Canberra area into the Murrumbidgee and further downstream and how much of, of extra water are we generating by having these um, paved surfaces. Mm. So what you're basically saying is in times gone by, more would have stayed in the landscape anyway, potentially. Absolutely, very definitely, yep. yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, so it's a question um, maybe um, for Plaxi, but it's, it's sort of a, a re related to some things that Kate was saying. Uh, I appreciated Kate's point about seeing water just as part of the landscape, not stormwater, which is a problem to be managed. Is that thinking being recognised in government? I would say that the use of um, more wetlands and rain gardens and so on is part of a shift in that direction. Um, but we do definitely still, because the, the main focus of our stormwater system has um, been on the safety issues that Fiona raised and flooding issues, I think we still have a um, pretty engineering based mindset around stormwater. Mm. And that stormwater management still sits within roads rather than with environment or even even ICON says right. says a lot, right? Mm. That's why they look like they do. <laughs> They're actually for driving on Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that one. <laughs> um, okay, uh, a question about permeable surfaces, permeable paving. Uh, cost versus permeability. Is there any advice on the best form of permeable paving? It's a very technical question, Gordon. Does anyone know anything about permeable paving? Has anyone used it? I know the government's starting to use it a little bit around the base of some trees in highly urbanised areas to try and improve the, the flow of water to the base of trees. Um, I know we've got some trials or have done some trials. 
actually, I don't know if the, we've got the results yet, but we're looking at using them, using more. I expect for the home driveway, you could probably just use gravel and that would actually be more permeable than a, than, well, bricks, it, bricks would be next step up and then the concrete's probably the worst in terms of getting through. Sorry, Gordon, we don't know the answer to that one. Um, car parking, small streets. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm running through opinions rather than questions here. Uh, so I would encourage you to read, to read the chat bar for people's commentary. Um, Cause it's very interesting, but I'm not sure I can find any more questions. So we've got a few more minutes. I'm going to open it to the floor. If people have got questions that haven't been answered or that you would like to know more about, I, you can put your blue hand up or you can just try speaking. There's a little um, raise hand. Or you can take yourself on, on off on mute and we can try it that way. No, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. So I'm sorry if I did miss your question. I'm hoping I got through all of those. But um, I just saw a hand raised. Oh, a hand. Like an actual physical person. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Apologies, I can't see all the people at the same time on my screen. So, it's so um, frustrating, isn't it? It is, it is challenging. Um, Joe Clay. Joe. Hello. Thanks, Helen. Um, so as climate change progresses, we're going to get more of the, the big events, the storms and the floods and the droughts and all that kind of stuff. Do we, are we doing the planning we need to do with our waterways on that? That'll be a question for me, I guess. Um, I'm aware of a new flood map that's been created and made publicly available in ACT Map I. Um, but I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not um, aware of what's happening in that area. But perhaps that should be a, I'll get back to you, note for, my, for me to find out what's happening. I've got another question here around water pricing. Should water be more expensive to encourage people to use it more responsibly? Ian, do you have a view on this? That's a good one. <laughs> yes, I, um, I've got views on a number of issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, irrigation water is, is um, a tradable commodity. Um, it's like any other thing. It's like iron ore or oil. It's a tradable commodity. Um, the price depends on its scarcity. Um, and it oscillates gigantically depending on its wet year or dry year. There's no control over pricing whatsoever. Um, in an urban situation, of course, you're looking at something different. You're looking at the pricing of water that's going through potable water supply pipes. Um, and, and that is controlled by the regulators. Um, there are a couple of comments I'd like to make. Um, the first one is, what are we really trying to achieve? Now, if we're really trying to achieve quality lakes, it's not exactly the same as trying to achieve quality streams. And I think what we're really wanting to achieve is actually quality lakes. Now, if we're going to achieve quality lakes, the best way you can achieve those, and it's been approached already with reasonable success by the methods that have been discussed today, um, but it's got to be more dramatic. Um, what they do in Berlin, for example, who has exactly the same problems we have, is to put in a water treatment plant on one of their major rivers, um, strip the phosphate out of it. And it works, but of course it's extremely expensive. A much better way, but rather difficult to do in Canberra, is to divert the high nutrient level water into irrigation systems where it's actually useful. You know, the best thing to do with um, sewage discharge is not putting in the river, it's the use of irrigating crops. Um, rainwater, stormwater first flush is essentially the of sewage. Um, the best thing we can do with it would be to catch it and use for irrigation, water, water ovals with it. Um, use it as a, an alternative to using potable water, which is a bad use of potable water to water our green spaces. Um, but we've got to decide what we really want to do and also what sort of resources we're going to be prepared to put into it. 
I think there are things we could do that are relatively more straightforward, which I'd like to <laughs> discuss with Fiona at some time. Um, in North Vietnam, they grow lots and lots of water weeds in the lakes, deliberately on floating rafts. You can harvest these, they can be a, a productive resource. At the same time, they're picking nutrients out of the water. And it's something which we've never actually tried in Canberra, and it's something that I think Fiona could ponder on one day. Mm. Thanks, Ian. Um, two new ideas, which I hadn't thought of. Um, sorry, the one you were talking about before, before the... Um, so what do we want to use our water for? So my understanding is that currently we do, we only use some of the um, water from the wetlands for watering ovals in the ACT, um, but it's quite restricted in terms of the non-potable water use. Across some water is actually siphoned directly off the creek. They've done that with um, Long Gully Creek. Some water is siphoned directly off and stored in a dam, uh, sorry, in an underground tank and they water part of Philip Oval with it. Uh, Philip. What's that? Edison Park. Right. Okay. Yeah. But there is actual like harvesting direct into a directly back into storage it. container rather than into a natural body. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I know. I do know that again. ACT oh. is quite reluctant to sort of set up lo lots of non-potable water <laughs> systems across the city. That was my understanding anyway from about ten years ago. Is that still the case, Fiona? Do you know if there's non-potable water is being used more widely now? So there's the inner north reticulation system where it's um, used through oh, yes. the, the inner north. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think there's significant opportunities associated with uh, using water from our, our lakes and, and wetlands and the, the urban runoff to water open spaces. Mm. Um, again, it's, you know, there's, there's the infrastructure in some of those areas and it is, is working quite well. Um, there needs to be more. I'm going to end on the last question, which is always the is always the dream. Is it possible that Sullivan's Creek stormwater drain, and I, I think the thing is that this applies to stormwater drains right across the city, uh, could ever be returned to a creek? I say yes. I even wrote that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess it's about how we can do it in a cost-effective yeah. way, and that's the challenge, really, isn't it? And in a way that brings everyone on board, everyone have a different idea of what a renaturalised creek would look like. It is a, you know, it is something that could be done, um, but it is incredibly expensive to be able to do it in such a way that it is a natural system when it's dealing with so much more water than would normally flow through a creek of that size. Yeah. Um, but I really think there's a need for a conversation about what we'd like to see in yeah. terms of our waterways. So starting with some really big picture um, conversations, as Ian kind of mentioned, what, what do we want from our urban waterways? What do we want to see in our suburbs? And how do we want it to look? And then we can start to, to work through and go, okay, well, this is, this is what we need to do to achieve that. Um, it's not going to be a quick process, but I think it's a process where we need to have the community involved, telling people what they want to see in our landscape and how we want our water to be to be managed because mm. we have we've spent a lot of time thinking about lake water quality and being able to use the lakes because the lakes have such high recreational value but i i think with the wetlands and the creeks coming on stream people have actually started to appreciate more as well the value I, that they look have. i can't do any testing down that creek without being accosted by people who are generally interested in what's going on who who go to that concrete channel every day with their dog or their grandkids or whatever and they genuinely give a shit about that piece of concrete and what's happening in it <laughs> with that kind of goodwill there is so much that can be done well that seems like a fabulous place to end tonight's discussion we're right on time um thank you so much to our three speakers um like Sima mccullough from the act government kate harridan who's doing a phd at the anu and Fiona Dyer from the University of Canberra. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the people who were able to attend tonight. We had over 100 registrations, which I think just shows the level of interest in this issue and how, um, you know, as a community, there's a real desire to start thinking about how we value our waters and our creeks and our waterways in a different way. Um, and particularly in a society where water is such a, a precious commodity, both for 
for life, but also for well-being and, and for the health of the ecosystems as, as well.